Hello, today I'm going to provide the answers to the two most important questions about wealth preservation that I released in a video a week before. And if you haven't watched it actually, I encourage you to go back, click on my YouTube videos, find it, it's about only a week old, watch that video because it's only three minutes long and then come back to watch this video to see if you can answer uh, those questions on your own first. So pause this video. If you haven't watched the previous one, go back and watch that one and then come back to this video. Okay, so basically the stumbling block for most people that have no clue how to answer those two questions is the fact that they have been tunnel visioned by mainstream financial propaganda. So they have a very narrow perspective and they've accepted the narrative that has been created by central bankers, commercial bankers, and politicians uh, about what is going on in these currency wars and that's why they haven't been able to think outside the box to come up with the answers to those questions. And secondly, most people, the narrative is, most people have been trained, which is a lie by central bankers and commercial bankers and leading politicians in this world, is that if you have more of something, then you're wealthier. So in other words, they're training you to think in terms of nominal terms instead of the most important aspect and quality of money which is purchasing power. So it doesn't matter if you have more euros, yen, US dollars, British pounds, uh, Brazil, Brazilian real, if the greater amount, the greater nominal amount of those currencies actually purchases you less. But most people are just trained to think, hey, if I had $100,000 today and $50,000, uh, you know, 20 years ago, then obviously uh, I'm twice as rich, but that is not the case because what people don't take into account is true rates of inflation. Now, all governments and bankers lie about the true rates of inflation. Like, no one really believes today in America, if you have your head screwed on straight to your shoulders, that inflation is anywhere close to 2%, or no one believes in the EU, where many EU countries are reporting inflation rates of 1.5%, that that's the real inflation because as human beings if we you know don't have servants working for us that buy our food that pay for our utilities that um you know put gas in, in our cars we see the increasing rates of uh utilities we see the increasing prices for food and we know that they're soaring and and that those inflation rates are not real so what i did is I actually went to shadowstats.com and I looked at the real inflation rates. In other words, the inflation that the U.S. government used to report as of 1980 using the U.S. government uh, inflation formula in 1980. Uh, looked at all the real inflation rates from 1994 because as I said, the, these two questions that I asked you can be answered within the time frame of the last 25 years. So we're not even going back to 1980 when inflation was like 13% for that year and 10.33% the following year. So in the 1990s, we're starting real inflation rates of 4, 5, 6% by the late 1990s, 7, 8, 9%, and then more recently, 8, 9, 10, 11% range. So if we're just looking at these true inflation rates I'm taking, this is factual, from the 1980 U.S. government formula for inflation. So to answer the first question, we actually only have to look at a window of the last 15 years, although I said both questions can be answered in the window from 1990 to 2014. We only have to go back to the year 2000. So assume I had $50,000 in the year 2000 and I just put it in a jar in my home, okay? So it's just sitting there not really earning any compounding interest, which it would if it were in a bank, but as we all know today in the US, there's virtually like no interest anyways if you leave your deposits in a bank. So consider I had 50,000 in the year 2000 and then in April 2014, I came into another $50,000. Well, if you look at the true inflation rates for the past 15 years, the $50,000 I had set aside from the year 2000 has now been reduced to when you factor in true inflation rates for the past 15 years has been reduced to the purchasing power of only $12,090. So if I had 50,000 in 2014 and I had 50,000 in the year 2000, you add that up, of course you have a nominal amount of $100,000. However, since the purchasing power of the $2,050,000 
has now been reduced to 12,090 in total purchasing power. Then you have 50,000 plus 12,090, which equals $62,090. So that is how 50,000 plus 50,000 can equal 62,090. The second question I asked was how can earning $3 an hour be more beneficial than earning $25 an hour? Now, I'm just gonna look at the numbers outside of the tax implications because obviously if you're earning $25 an hour, you're in a higher tax bracket so more of your income is being taken away in the form of taxes at $25 an hour. But this is assuming, I'm assuming uh, for a hypothetical scenario, I mean, this isn't a uh, real world scenario because obviously the tax implications would be much higher if you're earning $25 an hour. But assuming even taxes are the same, you could still say three, earning $3 an hour was, would be more beneficial than earning $25 an hour if you look at the um, period from 1990 to 2014, April 2014. So we're looking over a 25 year period. Again, looking at using the shadow stats annualized inflation rates, the true inflation rates between 1990 to uh, April 2014 over a 25 year period, then 25, 1990 would then become the equivalent of and have the purchasing power uh, by, the, by April 2014 of only $2.94. So what that basically means is that if you're earning $3 in 1990, that actually had more purchasing power than earning $25 in April of 2014. Now, I know there's going to be some instances where that doesn't translate uh, exactly because, for example, like movie tickets, you know, have not gone up, um, you know, eight times or nine times uh, from in the last 25 years. But I'm talking just using the 1980 U.S. inflation uh, formula, U.S. government inflation formula they used in 1980, where they're looking at an entire basket of goods and services. So some are going to be higher, some are going to be less. Well, that's, I'm just talking when it averages out. So if you're earning $3 an hour and you're accumulating this money versus earning $25 an hour, earning $3 an hour would have bought you, uh, you know, at the end of your weekly paycheck or your monthly paycheck, uh, more goods and services overall than $25 an hour in April 2014. So that's the answer to those two questions. Now, before I go, um, I just want to convey to you, because this video is relatively short, that you know recently I was speaking to a friend of mine that lives in one of the Asian cities I, I frequent, um, being here in Asia most of the time. And... I asked her why she left and she now lives in Europe and she told me because she was tired of the uh, focus on materialism in this one particular city so she told me she felt like most of the people were fake because all it ever seemed that they were working for was to buy the next Prada uh, wallet or to buy the next Louis Vuitton handbag so they, they could impress their girlfriends or vice versa with guys to buy, you know, the next Audi R8 or whatever type of car to impress their guy friends. And so she says she's kind of tired of the mentality and wanted more three-dimensional people. Now, if you understand the answers to my two questions here, then you will know that it's inevitable. It is inevitable that we are going to really experience some seismic shifts in the tectonic plates of global banking and economics within the next couple years and that people striving for material goods is going to come to an end just because the entire there's going to be entire uh, majorities of populations in every nation that won't have the wealth and the means to buy these types of luxury goods anymore so all I do is urge everyone right now to really try to prioritize. I mean, it's more important now to really, I would say, shore up your friendships, those people that you're really, really strong friends with and good friends with, to know that you have family, you have friends that you can rely on when things really become economically challenging because they will become really financially challenging for the majority of people over the next five to 10 years or so. So that will be the lifeline that will save a lot of us, not 
this obsession on materialism and um, you know really not forming any type of strong bonds or strong friendships with people that is the true wealth I believe that people should be concentrating on to get through these times um, you know okay and not only okay but to get through these times and still be able to have happiness and be able to have that uh, kind of camaraderie with other people that will be the type of unity and true wealth that uh, will be more valuable in the days ahead okay so thanks a lot for watching and as always remain intensely curious so long